I think we've got some uh, cases that we're going to present. Uh, I brought a case we'll start off with, and then I think uh, our panel here has uh, brought up a case, and, and uh, so there'll be surprises to all of us. Uh, I guess each panelist uh, that brought their case can, can uh, present it uh, maybe to the uh, audience and to the panel and discuss it. Uh, so let's start off and not waste too much time here. This is, is it moving forward or? Sorry. This is a, a gentleman in his mid-70s. I followed him and his wife, actually. They both have back problems. He's from Austria. They're both from Austria. And uh, he's 6'6", six, six, uh, and really has complained mostly of back pain, progressive over the years. I've sent him away. He's in good shape, very active. Actually, he, um, I'm not sure what the appropriate term is, but he backpacks all over the Alps every summer, taking pictures of birds. He's a photographer and uh, carries about a 40-pound backpack uh, full of gear uh, and is extremely active. He, came in last year and just said, listen, my back is killing me. I can't walk. I just need something done. And, you know, late, uh, mid-70s and really just back pain. I go, does your legs hurt? He goes, no, but I just can't stand. I can't walk. I'm just dying. Uh, and so these are his uh, lumbar films that we took in the office. Uh, and... Uh, so I said, well, let's get some, some more imaging. He's had epidurals. He's had physical therapy. And these are his bending films. And uh, this, I think, is his MRI. So if you see there, he's got, you know, I didn't include all the slices, but he's really got significant stenosis there at L3-4. He's got a disc herniation higher up, but that axial didn't show much stenosis there. Uh, and then this is his CT scan. Um, and uh, do any of the panelists want to take a, ask for any information or, or any recommendations? Uh, I can go back to, I think, uh, what he presented with here and go from there. Charla? So it looks like 5-1 is pretty stable. It's pretty deep in the pelvis. Um, so his problems are at 4-5, seeing if that is moving. Um, and then 3-4, there's a fair amount of degeneration. It doesn't look like 4-5 is moving very much. So it looks like on x-ray, his main issue may be at 3-4, and some of the other levels are pretty worn down. Um, so then you can take a look at the MRI to see if he has any significant stenosis there. Um, and then also just asking him if this is an acute flare-up of his symptoms or if this is just slowly progressing, getting worse and worse and worse. So sometimes if they have, like, they'll come in and say, you know, I was doing okay, and then all of a sudden in, around Thanksgiving, um, the pain just severely worsened. So then you're sort of thinking more of an acute on chronic issue versus them saying, crying uncle and saying this has just been progressing for many, many years. Um, so it looks like on MRI he does, is that cut at 3-4 there? That's 3-4. Four. 4-5's four, okay. got some lateral recess stenosis also, that, yeah. but 3-4's four, th is his worst stenosis. And then what's going up at 1-2? It's, uh, he's got is a lateral it? disc herniation there, but okay. no real central stenosis there. So it looks like most of his symptoms, and then if you go to the CT, he's got a lot of um, end plate changes. You can see 5-1 is stable on the CT. So um, it looks like most of his back pain is coming from the 3-4 level. So this is something very reasonable to consider doing um, a single level fusion in a you know, it could be a lateral approach, a lateral standalone versus um, backing it up posteriorly with screws. Um, so I think most of his pain is coming from that level. I don't know if any of the other panelists um, have uh, any other uh, comments or if they think some of the other levels are more painful. I mean, I think th this isn't going to be a home run. He's degenerated all over, but it looks to me like he has a, a spondy at 4-5. I'd want to see the facets at that level. Three, four looks very severely degenerated. I mean, in my practice, I'd probably try to block his facets if it's pure back pain at those two levels and see what kind of relief he gets. Uh, I mean, certainly that'd be my suspicion as to what's driving most of his back pain, but I think if you could get some sort of injection result that substantiates that, I'd feel better offering him something more, more limited there. 
because I certainly wouldn't want to do a huge procedure here. And it's all back pain? There's no claudicating symptoms? No. Other than it's back pain when he stands and walks, but yes, uh, it's all back pain. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those ones, no matter what you end up deciding to do here, that you really have to spend a lot of time setting expectations. I mean, this guy's back is very degenerated. Um, you know, it's you can decide on different strategies to try and pinpoint it, and I, and I agree, facet injections can really be helpful sometimes. And even if they are, maybe even push them towards ablations before you even talk about surgery. So, and he's had ablations, and I mean, I've pushed this guy off for years, but it was kind of a slow progression of, hey, I can't walk, and I know summer's coming up, and I want to go to the Alps and, and, and walk and, and so forth. So um, just to kind of move us forward here a little bit, does this change anyone's minds? So he's got a pelvic incidence, 44 degrees. And, you know, I didn't figure this out the first time. I looked at that initial. I, I give this case you know, I present this case because it's kind of a classic case that comes into our office and we get short lumbar films. We're thinking local stenosis, but he come, I, I, I saw him three or four times kind of pushing him off because there was no easy answer, especially the back pain and no leg pain, right? And so finally, I saw him walking down the hall with his wife and started to get a sense of something else is going on here. And so he's got a pelvic incidence, 44 degrees, lumbar lordosis, 10 degrees. Um, would this change anyone's mind in terms of what they would do? Just checking HLAV 27, just a counseling. Well, that's why I showed you that CT scan. If you look up higher, most of his thoracic spine is autofused. And so this is a guy where I think he's developing kind of a pseudo joint at 3445 and developed his stenosis there. And he's no longer able to compensate by extending at that level to stand up. But but it's more of a, to me, we did do that, but it looks more like a dish syndrome, but, but certainly something to, you know, to study. And this is, you know, I still sometimes fall into the realm of just getting short lumbar films, but this is a classic case where I think, you know, we got to start thinking about 36-inch films uh, on some of these degenerative patients. And I'll, I have another case, but I'm not going to show that exact same problem where I kept on pushing them off and it just the difficulty standing and walking. But to me, it's probably his stenosis, but also his sagittal imbalance, right? Uh, so any recommendations in terms of treatment? I mean, the main thing, I mean, th these films do help understand the whole thing a lot better. I mean, that sagittal mismatch is a problem potentially in the future, especially with doing something more limited. You could iatrogenically create something that you may not want to see later on. The real question to me now after your presentation is really no claudication, no radiculopathy, all back pain, had everything in the world done, he's not going away, you've counseled him, now what? And he wants to go be active. So, I mean, to me, that 3-4 really still looks like the biggest thing. I would really counsel him strongly. I'd say, look, to me, I would say, look, your spondy's not moving unless there's high-grade stenosis at 4-5. But, I mean, he's not claudication or radiculopathy. I would just probably, to me, I probably would offer him a 3-4 lateral and MIS perk and then just um, – I would really counsel him because, I mean, I don't know how I would be able to rationally include, I mean, at three, four, or four, five, I mean, I think, you know, doing both or one, but this, what changed it for me is looking at this three foot standing film. If I do three, four alone, then, I mean, even though I love laterals, you still can't get that sagittal plane really corrected. And I really hate to burn an A-lift level on a lateral that if he really becomes symptomatic, he's complaining of this. He's not complaining of I'm pitched forward and I'm, I can't, you know, do all these things. But if he does, personally speaking, I probably would rather have that four five five one a lift for the for the front where I know I can get that sagittal good in the back. So how, I probably would just do three four. And you know, in terms of a lateral, how much lordosis do you, you know, would you do an uh, anterior column release and release the ALL and try to get a hyperlordotic in there? Do you do just a, because he's got about a 35 degree mismatch and in my hands, unless I release the anterior longitudinal ligament and put a hyperlordotic cage there, 
you know, I can maybe squeeze out 10 degrees in these collapsed levels, but it's, it's a little bit more challenging, you know, to get restore much lower doses. I think he's got a big lever arm up top, and so I worry about doing an ACR and trying to get a lot of lower doses with a one-level fusion and what the stresses on that sort of uh, implant would be if you're not doing uh, a larger scale instrumentation. So I would not try to go hyperlordotic at 3.4. I'd probably just match it and say, it is what it is, and we're going to see if this improves your back pain if, if you go that route. And I agree, not burning 4.5 or 5.1 in case you really need to come back and do a much larger scale uh, operation. And, and the x-ray, you know, it identifies the coronal imbalance, but it also shows that it's happening significantly in the thoracic area, and to your, to your point. So I, I think that's just something he's been living with, and I'm not sure you're, you're going to have to do some pretty involved stuff to neutralize that. Okay. If so you look at age-adjusted okay. um, sagittal alignment parameters, you know, he is uh, pitched forward, but not terribly. And he may be having some lack of ability to compensate through the lumbar spine due to his stenosis and pain. Um, and then the other thing just to look at would be his, 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 his compensation in his lumbar spine um, and his pelvis. You know, if he's got any hip pain or arthritis or stiffness as well. Um, that's a lot, uh, preventing him from hyperextending. So would anyone do a decompression alone? For back pain? Well, for his condition. <laughs> it's back pain difficulty standing and walking. I mean, I think you could make an argument for doing a micro decompression at 3-4 only where it's so tight. But the problem is really you, what, what proof do you have that he's got an urgent related back pain. I mean, like, how are you proving that? You know, so, I mean, either way, you're, no matter what you, he's forced your hand, I mean, he's forcing your hand, um, but, or, I mean, obviously, yeah, send him to somebody to get a second opinion to let, let, let them see what they do, but at the same time, I mean, you're going to have to take a, a little bit of a leap of faith trying to figure out where the etiology is coming from for the pain generator, but I think something minimally invasive and something, you know, with, with less muscle in, invasion is definitely the key here for somebody who's back pain and this active. You know, an open approach for this is not probably what S I would do. Sig, he's, he's got your same sweater, comes into my office, he's a little taller than you, uh, and he just wants it fixed. Well, there's less back pain. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the points that you're making here about the lumbar pelvic mismatch is, is significant, and also the distribution of low doses is, is important. Um, and, and I think one of your questions about the decompression is, could this just be a compensatory uh, hypolordosis? And I think that our, our supine x-rays are really useful there. So either the MRI or the CT scan, if you just show that again, I really think that that uh, gives us the opportunity to um, see how much of this is really structural versus how much of this might be somewhat compensatory. And what's really remarkable to me here is the loss of lordosis from four to one. And it looks like that's really pretty stiff there. Um, from four to one, and I agree with exactly your observation that you got a stiff spine above, pretty stiff four to one below, and three four seems to be problematic. Uh, to bring this into a question, has anybody used? Uh, there, there's some new imaging that we've been working on recently that uh, superposes a CAT scan and a, uh, a, a C, and, and a SPECT scan. So rather than just a SPECT scan where you don't get the great resolution, uh, you get a CAT scan that's got this resolution, and it's superimposed upon that is the, um, uh, the actual uh, uh, bone scan. Has anybody seen that technology? It's something that uh, we've been working on a bit at UCSF. I've actually, I see a lot of these x-rays. Anybody at Cedars here? Um, from Cedars, they, they, their radiology group is doing it. But it shows some really nice images that basically uh, is a techni the technician isotope, which shows some bone turnover. And what is useful uh, for me is to look at, you know, when, when you're not sure which of these levels is generating some pain, you know, certainly 3-4 looks suspicious. I agree with Charlotte there, but at the same time, uh, how much is, is coming from uh, potential Four, increased uptake or activity at other levels? That, that's something that I've used before, too. I think the uh, point about facet blocks is something useful diagnostically, but to me, I, I'd, I'd want a little more diagnostic workup here to identify a pain generator. So, you know, we kind of took somewhat of a leap of faith, realizing you know, it'd be easy if all those levels were fused except the one or two, and then you could just, you know, kind of pinpoint that one level. But to me, 5-1 was a stiff level. It wasn't stenotic. You know, 
4.5 had a slip, uh, I think, on that flexion extension. It wasn't hypermobile, but he had a tall disc with no bridging osteophytes. And to me, to fuse above that and leave now a bigger lever arm at 4.5. I, I initially thought his stenosis would be all 4.5 when I got the x-ray. But, and then if you look at the CT, he's got the, uh, you know, the vacuum disc at 3.4. And so to me, I kind of took a leap of faith that 3.4 and 4.5 were his primary pain generators. And I want to do the least amount of possible. He's 76, 6'6", six, six, big guy, and decompress him, but try to align him. And, and so in our, my hands, I think you could do a lateral. I think you could, you know, 3, 4, certainly you could do a ACR, 4, 5. If I, I do them, but the studies clearly show that the incidence of complications for an ACR at 4, 5 are higher. So I thought, you know what, as I said before, with the A-lift, I can dial in the exact amount of lordosis I want. And so that's what we did. We did an HA-coded uh, A-lift at 3445 instrumentation. You know, I agree with you. I think if you get aggressive with a truly hyperlordotic cage and you pull someone back, I've had failures with short segment fixation. So I think that point's very well taken. But this guy, you know, it's kind of a home run and he's only three months out. So, but uh, he stands up. I really think his alignment and his inability to compensate for his alignment. And, and he couldn't tell me it was back pain or leg pain. You know, he focused on his back pain, but I think his stenosis and his nerd, his facet arthropathy and his, and his kind of instability at that level. So that's kind of a case where I just show that sometimes looking at the long films give you a little sense of, of where to go with the patient. So let's see, do you want to tee up the next case? On an, uh, do we have an order here? Or? And then maybe I can let someone with the mic uh, talk about the next case that's going up. Go ahead. Just a question while you're getting that next case up. This gets to your presentation, Jeff, but to the panel as well. So for whatever reason, maybe this is anecdotal, but it seems that at L5-S1, when people have top-down ground stenosis, it seems like it's more common on the left than the right side. They can ace the neck to this front, left here to the right, and the third one. Um, and they'll also get osteophyte Right where the left vein is tough. So it's right where you want to do the aggressive release where the vein is. And I'm wondering if you or anybody has any referrals on either mobilizing that vein or laterally to get all the, the bone out or medially or osteosome or spur. So again, that's I think the CT is helpful in terms of Two things, looking at the osteophyte, it's also helpful looking at the bone density of the end plate. If the end plate's sclerotic, I can get a little bit more aggressive by trying to wedge the vertebrae over open. If it's not a sclerotic, then I have to remove the osteophyte. So I have some homemade, basically A-lift trials that are sharp at the front, and it's only 10 degree height, but a little bit, of basically a wedge. And what I start doing is I clean out the discs a little bit at a time, and then I take that and, and hit it in, and it pops open some of those osteophytes. You really can only get away with it. And usually they are sclerotic end plates because it's because it's bone on bone collapse. So, I mean, we're pretty aggressive. Sig and I, when we trained, we did all, all our own anterior approaches. So between that and a good vascular surgeon, we can usually mobilize the iliac uh, artery and vein over that osteophyte. But if you want to work midline and take out the, the disc with a very fine curette and it's collapsed, you take this wedge, whereas if you try with a, a regular trial, it's kind of got a bullet tip, and it's, it's a bigger, it's a lo lower lordosis and so forth. So a high degree trial with a sharp edge, and if the wider the footprint, better, because you're, you're distributing the stress, and you can often pop open that, uh, that uh, disc space uh, and break open that osteophyte. I, I did one of these just recently where it was a large at four or five right-sided you know, osteophyte, and uh, I used a David distractor from the from the uh, Charité set where you can really go in and kind of have a very controlled distraction and put kind of T-lif spreaders in there. And I just got the vein pulled over as far as I could, rondured down some of that, bone waxed it so there was nothing sharp on, on that. And then you could hear the osteophyte pop up. I like the parallel distractor just because I think you get a very controlled distraction and you can watch, you know, for any bleeding occur as you're, you know, as you're doing that. So... Okay, do you want, let's. Okay. Can you uh, fast forward to that one I was showing you? Get the, get the clip. 
Okay. Oh, sorry, I'll go. You want to oh. do it? I'll give. I'll let you control the. Uh, we're just gonna get to the. Just. Well, that's a good one, but we're not gonna go there. But <laughs> we like that. Um, okay. Here. Okay. 38-year-old competitive triathlete riding his bike on River Road on the Mississippi River. Bam. Okay, comes in. One of my colleagues is here. Is Dr. Bowie here? Is Dr. Bowie here? Oh, he, he's okay. He stepped out for a second. <clears throat> so he was he was on call. He called me and said, "Hey, I think we need to do, you know need we need to do this together." Uh, he's he's weak. Um, He's three out of five in his uh, quads. Um, he's, he's definitely weak. He's got a neural injury. Everything else is fine. Really no other significant injuries from a polytrauma standpoint. But what do you do with this guy that's got two burst fractures with really bad problems? And, um, you know, that's the L2-3 um, axial. I didn't show the, five, the L5-S1 um, axial with that burst fracture. But very similar. It's got a a laminar fracture, it's a big spike going, you know it's gonna have um, a dural tear, um, very likely. And so, how do you approach this? Um, so, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, <laughs> two burst fractures far apart from each other like that. What, what are the, are the ligaments all intact I don't, above the L2 level? You know, up to L1 and, and posteriorly, the ligamentous complex? Everything's fine up above. No other injuries in the thoracic, cervical. I mean, everything else is fine there. These are the two injuries. So um, you can do the, you can definitely do the shark bite and, and a, a, you know, do a sort of almost an extended anterior lateral approach and get to both of these things in that way. If you're, if in general for these, I, I, I prefer to come in some form of an anterior approach, but Obviously, that's going to be a pretty extensive uh, procedure for somebody like this. I think one of the things you could consider is doing a, an A-lift approach at 5-1 and putting in, a, in some kind of whatever your cage of, of choices, whether it's an expandable or, or whatever you, you choose. That's dealer's choice. And then do a, a, a lateral approach um, and do a corpectomy through a, through a lateral incision up at L2. So it'll be a two incision, be less, less traumatic as far as the, the surgical approach, I think in a fresh um, burst fracture, it, it's not too difficult to get out the fragment uh, doing that approach as well. And then the same thing, putting in whatever you know, cage you've, of choice. And then I, I would, it's always tough now to, to sort of uh, talk to a 38 year old. 38, about. 38, he wants know, to ride the bike. Yeah, fusing him now, you know, potentially from L1 to S1. Um, but I think that's probably what I would, what I would do. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be too comfortable. Uh, one other thing. Um, so when I come in to see him, I was uh, at a, at a, um, you know, out, and, and Dr. Bowie called me, and then um, he said, oh, by the way, when he came in, he was um, unstable. His blood pressure was low. Oh, he had a, he had some type of a pelvic injury, and uh, one of your partners, uh, your pelvic partner, your trauma partner. Uh, he put this X fix on his front of his pelvis to close him down, and he says he's going to have to fix his pelvis uh, as well. So now he's stable. Yeah, he's in that. the ICU. He's got an anterior X fix on, but no belly surgery yet, and uh, he's not bleeding anymore. And he's got all of his family there saying, "What are we going to do? Um, my legs are weak." You know, the other thing to consider. I mean, that. Thanks for throwing that in there. And. Uh, the, the other thing to consider is if, you know, if they're going to come in and do some big anterior uh, fixation to fix that, and, and we're thinking that the majority of his symptoms are, if not all, as far as neurologically, are at L5, from the L5, it, it correlates to that? Or did you say there was some quad upper? Quad weakness. So maybe upper, yeah. Yeah. The, so. Any yeah. role here for... Uh, Temporary fixation at the upper burst fracture. I, I don't have personal experience. I know in Europe they're more aggressive with that, where you'd fix definitively L5 and consider. I mean, obviously that that vertebra, vertebral fracture above looks pretty crushed, but you know the canal looks pretty open. And could you do some type of posterior distraction?
temporary fixation and you know, see if he, he stabilized and then take that out at a later period of time and, and save him. I mean, the problem here is you fuse four to sacrum and then the level above and below that L2 fracture, you're leaving one disc in between two multi-level fusions and it's not a good scenario. And so I don't know if anyone has any experience with that uh, in terms of fixating fracture, burst fractures without fusing them. Can you actually where the nail reps it is? Is that L2, L3 trouble, or is it all 4, 5? I mean, he's weak in his quads, so we definitely think it's coming from the L2, 3. But, I mean, obviously, yeah, I didn't show you the axial here at 5, but he's got a big laminar fracture, that's, and, and then he's got that big anterior spike. They're basically touching at, um, at L5, S1, at L5. I think what, what you could have, I mean, if that if you thought it was all L5, you might just treat that non-op at, at L2-3 and take care of the business. But they're, because yeah. the ligaments are intact posteriorly, but if he's got neurologic weakness, that's that's tough. So fortunately, he didn't have any bladder injury, so the, um, the makes the anterior stuff easier. We just had a big counseling session. I mean, we had everybody talk to him, and... We, we had to go on and do the post here. We decided, um, we went back, we let our pelvic guy go on and do his pelvic ring fixation. Um, he played at his front. Um, he, um, actually he didn't, he just, he, he did take, he took off the anterior X fix um, after he fixed it in the back. He wasn't bleeding anymore. We went on and because of the urgency of his neural deficit, after he did this posterior fixation, we went on and fixed him in the back, posteriorly did a stage one. We just had a big discussion with him. We didn't see any way that we could get around this with, with these types of injuries. It's just a hard discussion to have. But we didn't, I mean, we didn't, we felt like our hands were twisted and just said, look, you know, your expectations to be a competitive, really, you know, kind of triathlete kind of person is just going to change, unfortunately. And we went on and did posteriorly. I mean, it was more like a deformity operation. Um, and we did go on and impact those fragments. There were just spinal fluid leak, dural tears at both of those areas. And um, Dr. Bowie did a great job getting those fixed for us. And then uh, his legs were stronger. And then we went, um, you know, stage three anterior. So this is where we went together with our pelvic guy. He fixed the uh, pelvic ring and plates it in the front. And then we uh, get our vascular guys to get a good cage here. We got some great access surgeons to be able to do that. And we did feel, I mean, you know, we, we got a post-op CAT scan on this after this. Those fragments are still pretty retropulsed at the L2-3 level. He's still a four out of, he's a four out of five in his quads. He's got some significant, you know, those fragments are still in the canal. So we felt like we kind of owed it to him. And so we did, that was what twisted our hand to go on and do a lateral uh, corpectomy. And then uh, we did get those fragments out. And now he's five out of five. And, you know, his life is different. I mean, but obviously, I mean, he's not going to be able to do what he used to do. But at the same time, this guy walks around. He's, I mean, he's walking around. He's functional. And he's back riding his bike, just not on River Road and <laughs> not crazy. So... Lots to do here, a uh, very difficult thing for us to try to figure out decision making on him, but I think, you know, it worked out okay. Did you get any neurologic improvement after the first surgery, after you went in and did your posterior and you impacted? We did, um, that's what we were saying. Okay. He was three out of five beforehand, and um, he really did get to where he was a fours, but he wasn't, you know, he was definitely still somewhat weak. Um, and we wanted to give him, we, we did give him a few days, obviously, like, I mean, this is a week before we finally did the lateral on him to try to just see if it would kind of really get better. He still did have some pain, I mean, obviously, in his thighs and whatnot. And we tried to just kind of let it be. And, of course, they're asking questions. I mean, could it be better? I mean, could this weakness be better, you know, if... We get this, we got post-op CAT scans after it to look at it. There's still retropulsion. And so then we finally did do the lateral corpectomy and, you know, his thigh symptoms got better and he, he, he's pretty happy from that standpoint. So we tried to leave, tried to leave it alone if we could because I think we had enough stability that he probably would have healed anyway. But that's not where we were. So tell us about putting one screw in at both L2 and L5. So it looks like you put one screw in, anticipating that you do the anterior corpectomy, but you did a unilateral. Oh, at, um, yes. So uh, for the posterior, I mean, obviously, um, we left the, uh, the screw out. 
um, that picture is not flipped on the left. So that is the right side is on the left. So we left the left L2 pedicle screw out, anticipating the possibility to have to come back. Always leave yourself an out there. And um, so that's why we definitely left that out on the posterior, just always planning for it if we had to. I mean, and then on the, the lateral plate there, you can see on the right side, it, we did have that other screw in, but it, it just was trying to tunnel a little bit more towards anteriorly. And so I just took out the, the second screw up top. Um, the other one was just getting blocked by the, um, it was kind of getting blocked by the pedicle screw posteriorly. So we just put one screw down below. I mean, not with these. Not with these burst fractures. I mean, you're fusing every single thing else. How much motion is really going to you going to be preserving for from the L34 disc? You know, maybe 15 percent. Yeah, but I mean, with those big of a lever arms, I didn't feel comfortable. And the other thing is, I mean, just with one level fixation below a significant burst fracture, three column burst at L2, I didn't feel comfortable just putting two caudal screws below that big of a problem. So, I mean, telling him I'd be much more worried about cantilever failure of those L3 screws torquing out, especially with a massive lever arm below and a massive lever arm above. I didn't want to have two caudal screws below an L2 reconstruct like that. And also, I was trying to not have to go laterally. And, you know, I mean, I would... Uh, you know, without a, and without a lateral, I was trying to avoid having to go lateral to do the L2 corpectomy. As you see, that was the last staged operation that we did here because sometimes more difficult and we really couldn't get it from the front. I mean, our guy could, is good, but, you know, with this guy's lordosis, there's no way for us to be able to get that, that canal cleared from the front that way. We'd already tried and impact it from the back. So to just go posteriorly and just put the L3 screws alone below that and try to avoid the lateral corpectomy with no anterior column support, I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, at that point, the last thing to, in our minds to think of was doing the L2 corpectomy. So that's why I didn't want to leave the, the level in between. Great. Uh, let's, is there another case that we can tee up? There's the post-op chats now. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have one? Just a question out there while they're pulling it up. Um, not for trauma, but for degenerative. Any, anyone doing or intrigued by this, a little bit of a movement for doing a, an ALIF in the lateral position? You know, the the goal being to to simplify the steps if you're going to do a bunch of lateral two three three four four five and not having to flip the patient I mean, some hospitals it's a, like mine it's a disaster to do any anything that might involve a pseudo turnover would well you might as well punch yourself in the face so the, any advantage anybody do that well, we, when we started, we actually did all a lateral l five s one through a lateral position because we went t ten to the sacrum so you just rotate, you get the patient taped down, you rotate them to about 45 degrees and, and, and so forth. I, I guess the question in my hands is, are you going to do it yourself? Then you don't need a vascular surgeon. If you're going to have a vascular surgeon, is there a need to do this kind of staged multi, you know, X lifts for these degenerative scolies or lumbar scolies and then do an A lift? Or do you have the vascular surgeon take that paramedian incision and just extend it and, and deal with the three, four, four, five all through one incision. But I, I mean, I think if your vascular surgeon is capable uh, and wants to try to do it through a, a mini, you know, open incision, that's certainly certainly poss po possible. I think doing it with, if you're not experienced doing anterior approaches yourself and trying to do it through kind of a oblique X lift approach, to me that's an, a very dangerous. <laughs> Because L5-S1, you have to mobilize those iliac veins and arteries and, you know, ligate the middle sacral vessel. So I think you need to, unless you're capable of doing that approach yourself for a true open approach, you need a vascular surgeon there. Yeah, I, mean, I, I trained doing the approach, but in my area, no one does their own approach. So it's yeah. sort of the medical legal standard to use a vascular. Yeah, I'll just point out, the obvious solution here would be to do more of an oblique. 
approach. And I, I actually, uh, you know, I don't think there's a clear distinction between what the OLIF versus LF versus XLIF is. To me, it's all a continuum, but in part, that's because I do a lot of vascular work, a lot of anterior surgery. I'm usually trying to stay as much in front of the psoas as I can. I think, Chandler, you, you said that. And uh, certainly at 4.5, I try and get pretty anteriorly, so oftentimes I am oblique there. Now, getting 5.1, in general, I'm going to do that between the bifurcation, um, and that usually requires a separate incision. And Jeff and I have got a lot of experience in doing that from, with the patient in a lateral position. And uh, certainly the, the OLIF advocates, anybody using an OLIF r routinely? And, and uh, you know, the OLIF uh, facilitates that, is, is doing an anterior from a lateral approach. Um, we're looking at comparison now between our ALIFs and our OLIFs, and I, I, quite candidly, I'm not very impressed with how much lordosis people are getting on the OLIF. I think that there's a terrific opportunity when we had the patient supine and really hyperextended, and when you cut that ALL, you know, you're putting in 30 degree cages, and uh, I'm not seeing that with, with the OLIFs. I'm not seeing reliable restoration of lordosis. I think a position has a lot to do with it, so I think there's some room for improvement on those. And, and right now, if I can go to 5-1, I'm doing a, doing a parent well, meeting. And, and I think there's some responsibility on both the surgeons and industry. I mean, I know there's a company that was sell, sending out their, their videos to all their surgeons with lateral position surgery where they do the anterior lateral, anterior L5S1 through a mini open and percutaneous, you know, L5S1 pedicle screws. And it, it was a great x ray. They got a 20 degree or 30 degree cage. But is that something you can reprodu reproduce, you know, in every community hospital with every community surgeon and not get into a complication that could be catastrophic? And, you know, the x or direct lateral is a challenging approach. I mean, you know, a lot can go wrong. And we've seen in our community, renal vessels, ureters, iliac vessels, and so forth. So I think that there takes some responsibility. There's great surgeons out there that can push the envelope. There's no doubt. But... You know, as long as you have the backup in your hospital, the vascular surgeon or whoever that, you know, can back you up if something goes wrong. And in the universities, I think it tends to be a little bit easier to grab a vascular fellow down the hall and say, hey, I need some help now. But in a small community hospital where you may not even have a vascular surgeon in the hospital and you're doing kind of a, you know, a oblique approach to L5S1 without any vascular, you know, backup is, is, is dangerous. Yeah, at NYU, and maybe Jonathan's going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow, once we got the robot, people were really interested in the OLIF so that they could do a single position anterior approach and then use the robot for the percutaneous screws in the back, and um, but still using a vascular guy to... Yeah. Um, do the approach for the OLIF. So, and as well as doing the 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 direct laterals with the in a single position to try and minimize that time for a flip. And you, if you have a really good vascular surgeon, and we do, um, if you ask him to do an OLIF versus an ALIF, the incision is about the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like you're saving a lot. No. And the exposure time is about the same. Yeah. And a lot of times now, when I do OLIF, because I do it quite frequently, um, I will use ALIF. Slightly different incision, but it's not like you're saving a lot of tissue no. by doing the uh, what, what you're doing is you know, fascinating, or what individuals are doing with the one position approach with the screws with the nasal or the robot makes a lot of sense because then you're saving, it sounds like in your case, 45 minutes of or, or, or more repositioning. And you know, that's, that's big. You know, and this is not new. You know, I trained in. Jean-Pierre Farsi was with who I trained with. He published on open one position anterior, you know, posterior uh, surgery, putting screws in. So it, it's, you know, we always reinvent the cycle. I think, you know, obviously with the Mazur and maybe some of the stealth stuff, it's obviously a lot easier to put the screws in through a lateral position. But, uh, you know, it, it can be done. I mean, I, I do a lot of uh, x lift with unilateral or bilateral perk in the lateral position. And the primary driver to that was just the saving in time. And they've done, they've done well. Jeff, I think let's, let's wrap it up here. So we Great. Front, we did a good job of timing. Thanks a lot to the panel. We'll get maybe see, has time for uh, other cases later. But thanks to the panel. Thanks for a good overview on anterior surgery. Um, this afternoon.